In this episode, I'm going to be talking to Kunal Madgonkar, who is the media manager at uh, Bengaluru Football Club, or BFC as the fans know it, about how he built one of India's most passionate fan bases. Uh, Kunal joined BFC at inception about six years ago and has been integral to its growth across these many years. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, him and I know firsthand how passionate he is about the sport and the club itself. Also, he's probably the only guy I know who's been to North Korea. Hey, hi Kunal. Hi, hi. So much for the intro, man. The North Korea bit kind of nailed it. <laughs> so, Kunal, what was North Korea like? Ah, oh, was probably the most surreal experience of my life. Uh, something that I would gladly do all over again. It was probably the weirdest place I've been to. And every single minute had, had a different story, so... I've just come back with so much, so much content for like six days. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just, every time I, I need to kind of realize that I went there, I just opened my passport and checked the visa stamp. And it's just, it's yeah. just crazy. <laughs> must, be, must be crazy going through airports, right? With the uh, North Korea visa stamped on your uh, passport? Uh, it is. Uh, at some, at, I mean, we travel so much with the club and there are some places where immigration officers kind of flip through your passport and they stop and yeah. look up at you and look down again. And it's, it's quite amusing. It is quite amusing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, let's back up a little bit. Uh, tell us about the early days at the club. What were, uh, you know, what were the early days like with BFC? Uh, so, uh, long story short, I joined the club uh, before it was called what it eventually was called. Mm -hmm. uh, all the email that I received said that there is a club in Bangalore and they're looking for a media manager. So I just took this massive leap of faith. I used to be a journalist. Mm -hmm. I took the job, uh, came to Bangalore for the first time, for the first year of my job as media manager at BFC. I did not know what it entailed. Mm -hmm. I've never been a media manager in my life. And so it's just completely new for me. But yeah, I mean, we we had a we had we had a blank slate, a completely blank slate. Mm. No, no history to fall back upon. Uh, absolutely nothing to kind of make my job easier. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, we went about we went about things uh, with, with a completely different approach. And the management was great. The owners were great. I got a massive free hand. If I mm. say so, do things and. Uh, we made a lot of mistakes. We got a lot of things right, but the good thing is that we kept we kept. I mean, we kept at it. Yeah. So the early days was, like I said, was really strange because I mean, Sunil Chetri was the only name on the roster that we knew. Yeah. I mean, the others knew, not not us. So yeah, I, I mean, every time we, we stepped onto the pitch at Bangalore Football Stadium, we wonder. Oh, when September 22nd does come around, which is the date of our first game, mm -hmm. how are we going to fill this place up? Just how who's going to show up? Yeah, who's going to show up? Mm -hmm. I mean, why would they show up? Is Sunil Chetri alone not big enough for angle or reason to kind of pull them? Will they come once? Will they keep coming again? Mm -hmm. What if it's so bad that, that I mean, the city just falls out of love with us after like two games, three games? So there's so many thoughts here, so many thoughts, all of us who assembled, didn't know the language, didn't know the city. Mm. And uh, yeah, it was basically building a team on the pitch and outside of it. I mean, both were really strange experiences. And I, I belong to the outside of the pitch, but I was uh, lucky enough to, to be privy to the way uh, the coach and the management went on building the team on it. So yeah, right. something really special. Right. What were the advantages of starting with a blank slate? I mean, you mentioned that there was no precedence, right? Uh, on how you should go about doing this thing. Uh, so what were the advantages like? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I would say at first it did, did feel like a slight disadvantage. Because mm. at some, some point she wanted to turn back and find some sort of cushion. But like, I mean, I think the blank slate is the biggest advantage. It mm. is the biggest advantage because uh, Everyone who kind of came to the team, and I mean, when I say everyone, I mean players, I mean coaching staff, and I mean uh, non-technical staff, that's all of us. We all came with, with, with a single aim to kind of change something in the world. Mm. So, and that's why the team was assembled the way it was. Mm. That we 
all of us we were completely willing to dunk ourselves into this project mm. and uh, be the reason of some sort of change. So when you have a blank slate, you said there was your your I mean the the plaudits are yours, the mistakes are yours, you will get them. So right, right, and, and you get to learn a lot there. Yeah. So there's everyone's. It's just that everyone's pushing and pulling in the same direction. Yeah, but um, I mean, with with with, it's just a single aim of, of kind of getting this club to where we want to be in our respective fields. So I think the 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 blank slate was the biggest advantage that we had to be very honest because we made the rules then. Right. You kind of lived and died by your own uh, decisions, right? I mean, you didn't have like a plan B or a fallback as such. Pretty much, pretty much. Like I said, we got a few things wrong. We got most things right, which is, I mean, the success of the clubs enjoyed is testament to that fact. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but it was, I mean, there was not, there, and there's still, after seven years, seven seasons, there isn't a single regret of what we did wrong. Yeah. We, I mean, they say you either, you either win or you learn it. Right. So, and that, right. that, that we took that upon us even off the pitch. Yeah. No, the fact that you guys are able to fill up stadiums and, you know, have this passionate fan base today is mm -hmm. testament to all of the good work that you put in, right? And BFC is a very unconventional club in that respect. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit in terms of what makes it different. But before that, uh, you know, what was the role of the founders itself, you know? Um, having people who are not just involved financially, but also like emotionally connected with the uh, with the club, right? Like Parth, I'm sure, was in the stands uh, on, you know, on the ISL finals, for example, right? Having them be there along with you, not just like, you know, in, as an investment, but even emotionally being connected with you. How much of a help is that? That is everything, to be honest with you. That is everything. So, I mean, these are not just owners who treat the club as a as a small pet project mm. or you know mm. one of your fun things that hey listen I want a football club. Right. But but they had a blueprint in mind. They sat over every possible meeting uh, at the outset. They were the ones responsible to put together the right team. I mean right from the management and you know then lower the management then I would talk to kind of assemble on the team below them. So they got it right from the outset then. And uh, like you said, they're really emotionally invested in the club. And even till day, even till season seven, I mean, I get texts from Bart uh, just talking about the game, you know, how good were we or how bad were we, mm. uh, what's the attendance looking like, and we were really loud on television, I mean, the fans, that is. So mm. even after season seven, that kind of involvement is there, not just because we won. I mean, this season we, was the first season we didn't win anything. Great. But yeah, but his involvement was was uh, so solid as always. And even uh, when we have these annual awards nights and when the owners come down speak to the team, they're not they're not just saying such general things. They're yeah. they're picking out specific events. They're picking out specific minutes in a game that yeah. they saw that, that that you know affected them. They got them jumping out their sofas at home. So. I mean, when you know that you are you are part of a team that has owners like this, it mm. makes your job so much more easier. And another really important thing is that we're in a place where we can we can disagree with a suggestion that comes from the owners or from the management if we think it's in the best interest of the club. If if option B is 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 something we know will do better. Mm. Uh, we, we we don't think twice or it's in that kind of environment we don't think twice about saying something to the owner. Yeah, so free to operate basically. Yeah, and that's that's just that that thing is the best part about this club. Right. And and everyone takes it in the right spirit because they all know that every one means the best for the club. Mm. So mm. you're not just saying it to sound arrogant, you're not just saying it to prove a point. Yeah. Uh, you're just seeing it because you really realize that, listen, this is yeah. the right way for the club to move ahead. So it's a brilliant space to be in. I don't think many people can say that because I've interacted with a lot of people and a lot mm. of clubs and so many times they've just got to do things in the other state, even if it's yeah. irrational, even if it's not practical sounding, but because it's come from above. So that's not the case here. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, one thing that, you know, I, I've personally worked with you as well, so I understand that is that how you guys don't have any egos in any of these things, right? There's absolutely no ego involved. 
and it's so very clear that literally everyone is trying to do the best for the club in whatever it is that they're doing right no, so I, yeah i mean uh, and and sorry to cut you but i think i think i think i think the best example that i could give you for that was uh, the first game that we ever played mm. uh this is a little anecdote that few people of people don't but uh, when sunil chetri was was on the team he joined mm. the club slightly later than the others because he was with the national team then mm. and ashley westwood was our coach at that point in time ashley westwood was the whole yeah. english mentality and you know he just changed the game completely right uh and uh, i mean uh fitness physical fitness was such a key component in westwood training and when sunil came he came on fit and uh, i'm sure even sunil expected to walk straight into the team straight into the first eleven but that didn't happen uh, so for our first ever game where all of us are you know like fretting and like i told you we sat in the middle of the pitch at 2 a.m. and like before and said hey how is this is this place going to fill up or not mm. and we just found solace in the fact that sunil chetri is on the team so it will fill up and the next day in the afternoon we get the team sheet and chetri is not on the team he's on the first 11 he's on the bench shocks <laughs> yeah so we just didn't know what to do so we got the best player the indian captain the one known name on the team to get the crowds and he's on the bench and we have the owners in the stands and we've got a brand new coach and we're playing mohan badam which is probably the most celebrated best known club in india club in, in india so yeah it was i mean but we later figured out that uh, westwood wanted want to be honest with the team yeah. and wanted to be honest uh, with himself to his beliefs and he had to make this really tough decision and he picked up the phone and called up sir alex ferguson Mm. because wow. Alex Ferguson yeah was is still his mentor and uh, Westwood came out of the the Man United academy mm-hmm. so he called up Sir Alex Ferguson and said uh, this is boss and this is the situation and i have uh, india's equivalent of cristiano ronaldo on my team however he isn't fit like i would like him to be but it's our first game as a football club the owners understand the fans are going to come what should i be doing and uh, alex alex focus and told him that uh, i mean he he told alex focus that i won't block him and alex focus said that that's the right thing to do but just make sure you call him in your room and tell him this on his face so ashley west would call him to take to his room and explain to him why he's dropping him and sunil chetri being sunil chetri uh, was honest enough to accept it was sure no ego at all yeah so yeah. that was a mark of all of us at the club uh, from from the, the, the players the, the coaching staff and the office staff that listen you could be sunil chetri but your your, your place is in taking for granted wow wow fantastic story fantastic and you know bfc is not the typical club at all right so one more nuance that i notice is that you know even though you are owned by jsw uh, which is you know one of the biggest conglomerates in the country you've been really prudent about how you spend your resources right so you've been um, you make i i feel like you make like that rupee go a long way right uh, you're really resourceful you're really scrappy about uh, all of the stuff that you do right uh, and that was also apparent i didn't like it back then when i worked with you guys but but i realized right i mean i used to i remember i used to go back from meeting you guys and i used to tell this to sudipto as well who was my co-founder at that time that man i mean look at them they they so they have all of these resources but they're so wise with how they spend it right because the one thing that was apparent is you guys had plastic chairs sure. right i mean that is amazing so yeah i mean how who built that culture right you know no is you you got the spot on and 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 it's a nice thing because you can relate to it all the more because you worked with us yeah <laughs> uh, but no and this is the reason why everyone's with the club is because like i said it was not it was it's, it didn't start as a as a toy it wasn't mm-hmm. something that you know hey listen let's try just, yeah let's yeah let's just go let's just dive basically head in and we'll figure we cross the bridge when we come to it that's that's not the approach we took uh it's it's owned it's owned by the by probably one of the biggest businessmen in 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 the country yeah uh but they are who they are because of the way they spend their money and uh 
this club was another fine example because if you pull out stats, uh, there's about close to two and a half dozen Indian clubs that have shut down in the last decade. And mm-hmm. that is because they've got no financial plan. Right. Uh, I remember when I was a journalist, I was, uh, I don't know if I was lucky or fortunate, uh, but I happened to break the story of Bahinza United, mm-hmm. uh, which was then one of the most professionally run clubs operating out of Mumbai, owned by Anand Mahindra, uh, shutting down. And I remember I, after I wrote the story, I got a call from Mr. Mahindra's office and then I had the chance to interview him, get his view out there. Mm-hmm. And, and it was really evident because he said that there is no financial plan ahead and you know, it's, it's, it's just money going. Right. Yeah, which which is a truth. I mean, and he didn't see any way ahead for the club, so he, he kind of pulled the plug on. Right. Uh, so you cannot see, listen, whoever you are, no matter how much wealth they're holding in, if they lost money, is lost money. Yeah, it's not infinite. It's just simple. Yeah. Whatever, whatever you're losing, you're losing it. Mm. And, and that's a down. So, the club set out right from year one to be self-sustainable at some point. It won't happen, maybe, maybe it won't happen for as long as all of us are there, for the next few years at least. It's going to take a lot of time. But we're right. on the right track. So every season, in season seven, we've cut down losses. Mm-hmm. So it's all about cutting down losses. So with every, with every season, uh, I mean, the aim is to kind of eliminate certain things and make the losses keep going. Right. We were a long way from kind of, of breaking even and, a, and an even longer way from running the profits. But th- that vision is there right now itself. Right. So that's why, I mean, we work with you early, early days, early stages. So what happens is people go crazy early on and then realize, hey, this is not yeah. working out. You know, make, yeah. anyway, it's not that we haven't made financial mistakes. We have. Mm. But we, we've been really quick to learn from them. And uh, yeah, I mean, Another testament to the fact is that uh, even in the I League and stuff, where we won two I League titles in three years, we were I think sixth or seventh uh, on a list of ten clubs in terms of budget spent. So oh. we were not, yeah. Oh, everyone kind of took it for granted. Oh, it's owned by the Jindal, so you guys got a lot of money. Mm. No, it's it's not like that. Even even vendors that came to us, oh, JSW, fine, this is our code. No, it doesn't work like that. Right. I've, been, I've been given three rupees to play with, or I have to play with in three rupees. It's simple. Mm. It's very simple. So Fantastic. I couldn't run to the management and say, hey, listen, can you give me two more rupees? Mm. And they in turn couldn't run to the owner saying, hey, can you give us two more rupees? So right. everyone knew this from the outset, and we still know it. It's still a fight every single day. Right. And and, and, and to just give you an example, it's, it's something that I always throw, but it's something that puts... Uh, the whole spends and in, into perspective is uh, I never tire of saying this, but so we, we get we get a minimum of, of nine home games a season mm-hmm. and a maximum of ten if we make the semi-final. Uh, our average our average profit from merchandise sales at a home game, which is your, your biggest seller because you've got about 15, 20,000 people come. Our average profit from that, we will need to sell 180 home games a season if Sunil Chetri is to pay the salary. Wow. So I need, I get nine home games a season. I will need 180 home games a season. And I'm only talking about one player. Great. Great. This club has 35 other players in the senior squad for B team. Mm-hmm. And under 18, and under 16, 15, and under 13, 9. The academy and everything, right? Just the works. So shocks. Exactly. Yeah. Shocks is pretty much yeah. I mean, it's putting in my leave at that stage. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, if you're not careful, I mean it can just quickly go out of hand, right? I mean, as you mentioned, people shut down all the time. Uh yeah. So another way, I mean, BFC is very atypical is how amazingly accessible the players and the management is with the with the fans itself, right? I mean, you see that in every game, you see that in every league. You guys uh, are so damn accessible, right? Was that an intentional thing or did that uh, just evolve? Uh, how do you keep that up and how do you keep that going? 
No, it was it was completely intentional. Right. It was completely intentional. Uh, because, like I said, we had a blank slate. We had nothing to, to shout out from the rooftops. So we said, listen, we have got to erase this, this boundary that, of sorts. Yeah. That is, is, is pleasant where you think, oh, that's a professional player. No. But it mm. is a boundary just enough where the fan thinks that he or she is invested in the team. Obviously, they are. They're not just, well, we're not here to take your money for a ticket, man, Jesse. If you have a suggestion, you can literally walk into our offices and tell us. Uh, we we had players calling on fans, you know, giving them. We we did all of this, so right. so we had this. Uh, just to give you an example of how we kind of erase those those boundaries between fans and players. Uh, in the first season, we had a player called Sean Green, who was an Australian striker, and one of the games in the middle of the season, he kind of lived out with a hamstring injury. So we got a message from a fan on Facebook saying. Uh, is Sean yeah. Green all right? We said, listen, why don't you give us your phone number and maybe we will call you up and tell you. So we got Sean Green to call the fan up and give him a whole medical lowdown of what's what's wrong with him and how he's working at rehab and what game does he cite as his comeback. And this fan went all over the place saying, listen, Sean Green called me up and he's getting fit, he's coming back. And you know, so things like that. You had, you had, uh, because of the relationship we've kind of built with the fans, we know them, we know their personal stories. Which also allows us to get our coaches and our players to reach out to you know the people during during birthdays, during weddings, during deaths, during difficult times. It's you know we've always communicated with our fans that our doors are always open. It's just beyond football. We're a community, and this is this is just more than Saturday night, 7 p.m. and uh, 3 p.m. and a title. So and, and the good thing is that we got a buy-in from the players and the coaches early on. Yeah, they, it's important that they respond yeah. uh, not like not, not not because they have to, but they because because they feel it. Yeah, exactly. That's that's and that's the difference. I mean, these boys could still fake a smile and sign an autograph and you know do stuff. But no, it's uh, very genuine. They they kind yeah. of did it genuinely the first year round, and they got back that kind of love. Yeah, which they weren't used to anywhere else, and. It just passed on from every new player who came in the subsequent season. So maybe our newest player yeah. who comes will always say, hey, listen, this is just something different. They have played in front of bigger platforms, on bigger platforms, in front of bigger crowds, uh, better atmospheres. But they all admit that the, the kind of family that this club is, is that, mm-hmm. that feeling they've, they've, they've struggled to get. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, so one of the things that's immediately obvious when you meet a BFC fan, right, is not just, uh, it's it's not just their passion for the sport itself, but it's for the people as well, you know. Uh, they really cherish those memories that they've had with the players, with the ma- at the matches and so on, right. Uh, and, you know, it's not just the uh, West Block Blues guys. Right, I mean, it's even the even on the away games as well. You guys are building up a, a pretty steady following, right? How do you do that? So, uh, like I said, we, we get so much of we get a lot of, of mail, a lot of tweets where uh, you know fans have literally written, written to us saying, "Listen, I was going through a really bad phase in my life, but this club kind of saved me." And that's when you realize that listen, <laughs> it's not just football for everybody. Significance beyond football, right? Exactly. It does take a lot for someone who's gone through personal tragedy in England, which it has happened on so many occasions. Uh, fans with mental health problems, uh, you know, saying that they found solace, they found strength with the way the clubs perform, uh, with the way the clubs come back from defeat. They've taken it as an, uh, as an example for their lives. And, and I mean, we just show this, we show this to the players before a game on a screen, before they step mm. out. Uh, in, in obviously in, in consultation with the coach so many times and we say listen when we walk out of that tunnel those guys they feel this about you you mean this to them so you know when you're going out there you're playing for them and uh, I mean it's, it's, it's fantastic man and like I said it's got a lot to do with the relationship we do. we've taken the trouble to kind of personally invest ourselves in their lives yeah. in their yeah. stories it's not just hey we hit 20,000 fans right now it's far out of control Tickets are being sold, brilliant. No, we still make an effort. We know a lot of fans on a first name basis, and I don't think a lot of clubs can say that. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. I mean, uh, so it's so obvious as well that it's not a number, right? It's not like, you know, uh, uh, these fans are a number like 20,000, 30,000, whatever it is. Uh, you have a real relationship with uh, these uh, folks, right? Yeah, and like you, like you mentioned, you mentioned about away games, okay? And that is something we constantly are amazed about even after seven seasons because away games, you end up spending money, a lot of mm-hmm. it sometimes. You mm-hmm. spend time you're booking yourself in a hotel. Uh, we've had fans travel to our away AFC Cup games. We've had a mother and a son travel to watch us play in Turkmenistan. Of all wow. people, yeah. Why would you do that? Why? Why would you spend money? Why would you leave your work, your family, whatever it is, and travel to Turkmenistan with all this? Yeah. To just watch us play. So, Insane. yeah, we went to Turkmenistan and there's about uh, 15,000 home fans and two away fans. <laughs> and uh, we lost, but the whole team went over to those two and clapped for them. And those moments are something that are just, I mean, you just can't take them away again. And you, can, yeah. you cannot put a price on it. So yeah. it's just fantastic to, to, I mean, I ask myself, would I have taken leave from work if I had another job? Would I have mm. booked tickets, travel, book hotels to support my local team? Right. And I'm not sure about the answer. Yeah. So No, I don't think a lot of us can exactly, as well, right? Exactly. I mean, it's just, uh, to make someone feel for something or someone to that extent, right? Absolutely. So, so how do we, how do you make this commercially viable for the uh, club itself, right? I mean, this type of a fan engagement, you know, uh, whether in ter- whether it's in terms of your merch or you know any of the other stuff, right? Uh, I I also know that you have some partnerships as well, going with some sure. other brands and stuff. Yeah. So how do you make any of this commercially viable? Because you you are spending a lot of money as well, like you mentioned on those away games and everything. So how do you think about that? No, uh, like I said, this is going to be a massive process, and maybe when we won't be around to kind of see the uh, yeah. see the fruits of our labor, if I may say so. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, it's 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 moving in the right direction. I mean, right now. Uh, we're a club that has uh, a giant like Kia on the front of our shirt. You know, right. I mean, Kia Motors chose Bangalore FC to step into India and launch because they have mm-hmm. a leader sport. So that says a lot. Uh, the kind of work that our sponsorship team is doing to sell the club. So it's mm-hmm. it's, it's so interrelated. The boys do well on the pitch. Uh, we kind of, you know, uh, cash in on that to build mm-hmm. and better the fan base. Once we have both that going for us, the sponsorship and marketing team comes and says, hey, listen, you've got a great product to sell. So, right. like I said, everyone across across rooms in that building is pushing and pulling in the same direction. So, right. uh, right. it, it's, it's, it's a long process, but yeah, we're still, we're learning, we're learning from the best, we're taking best case practices, we're using all our contacts, all our, uh, you know, relations to, to get on calls with people and figure out how to do they're doing things right. Right. I mean, just last week we were on a call with the people from Barcelona because our coach is from Barcelona, and right. we wanted to know a few things, and they were gracious enough to, to get on a call with us and answer our questions for about forty-five minutes. So mm-hmm. we we don't think we've made it anywhere, and that's the nicest part because it's really easy to get complacent when you win six titles and you're hailed as the most professionally run club in the country over the last decade and things like that. Yeah. But for us, every day is a learning process. Like I said, the best case example is is to give you is that, that right after our awards night, which is technically our last day of the season, when we play our last game and we step into the next day, it's an awards night. It's a tradition where we honor everyone, which we part of the club and things like that. The next morning, we get an email from the management the bosses saying, like, great job, guys, but work on the next season begins today. So awesome. yeah, so work, work, and and we've got this meal every single season, whether we won right. or we lost. We work, work on the next season begins today. It's simple. So right. I mean, obviously, we kind of take it slightly easy in the beginning, but that that mindset of not dropping the ball is there right from yeah. right from from the next day. A new season begins then, yeah. and everyone's so energized about it. I've yeah. never heard anyone moaning saying, "Hey, listen, come on, we, we can do it." Mm-hmm. And, and genuinely, the season can take a toll on you. It does take a toll on you. 
because you are literally uh, just in and out, away games, hotels, airports, immigration, security checks, uh, three points, no points, one point, uh, yeah. a 90th minute winner, it's a, grind. a 90th, it's a grind. yeah, it's, it takes, it's take, it, it takes so much out of you. Then you come yeah. back and then that translates to your family back home and here, there, you're not going to talk to anyone. It's just so much, man. So yeah. you kind yeah. of want to put your feet up and relax after it's all over, irrespective of what the result is. However, that's that's not the culture at the club. So we start work the next day. It's, mm. uh, in fact, so much of our work for next season is already kind of uh, past the approval stage right now. How, right. how are we going to launch our kids? Our kids have not even come. But we know how we're going to launch them. Uh, what are we going to do for away games to encourage fans to travel more? Is that a plan uh, to hold more screenings for away games when we travel back in Bangalore? So, just so many things. So it's, yeah. it's the, the vibe, the energy is is unbelievable at the club. Man. It's unbelievable. And it it just it just gets carried forward from the team to the management. To the, everyone's got the same vibe, which is phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, the culture uh, of the club itself, right, it's so tangible. I mean, you, you can you can feel it, actually, right? And uh, uh, as a media manager, as sort of the, the, the uh, what do you call it, the megaphone of the brand as such, right? Brand BFC as such. How do you communicate this to the fans? How do you communicate this to, you know, media uh, and other stakeholders, you know? I... I've seen your match reports. I mean, like, you know, you are so diligent about it. You're so particular about it and stuff, right? But even things that are written by, let's say, journalists, I mean, somehow this whole infectious enthusiasm and culture seems to, like, you know, carry forward in their writing of whatever BFC is also. True. No, you're absolutely spot on with that. And it's, I think, if, if, I, could, if I could use one word to kind of sum all this up, or the one word that ties all of this up together, it's honesty. There's an honesty, there's a there's a high level of honesty in everything we do. Mm. We've never needed or we've never had to pick the phone up and say, hey, listen, guys, I mean, well, I'm talking about journalists or the media. Why don't you write about this? That's not mm. us. We've never done that. If there is merit in your story, great. If there is yeah. no merit, no problem. Mm. If you want a reaction from us, you call us up, we get, we get, we get one for you. So mm. there's this nice, there's this really nice degree of honesty. Yeah. And it's not like, oh, you've written a bad word about us, so listen, you're going to be given the cold shoulder when it comes to an interview. No, mm. that's not how we operate. And even with the fans, I mean, we're really honest about it. Uh, the, the coach, the players go to the stands, talk to them, uh, respond on so many platforms to them personally. Uh, you know, a fan could come to the club to buy a, a piece of merchandise and just walk in the coach's room and say a few words. And take coach. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, it happened so many times. And the doors are never yeah. shut. Yeah. The coach, uh, I don't think he should have played a 4-3-3. And coach will sit and discuss why he played a 4-3-3. And he, I mean, these guys don't owe anyone an explanation. They're professionals. Yeah. They get paid for it. They're winning your titles. But they do it. They do it in, in, in victory. They do it in defeat. Uh, and same with every other department that the club did. So, the this whole this whole vibe of honesty that this club is run with, I think, yeah, it, it, it spills on to the fans. It spills on, and we we don't need to sell our story. You know, mm. we don't need to shout about our honesty. Mm. So that kind of translates to the way the media, uh, uh, you know, perceives BFC. Exactly, perceives the club and the, way the fans do it, and it's just it's just nice. It's it's a really nice place to be. In. Yeah, fantastic. So I think you've spent what six years with the club now, six or seven? Seven. Yeah, I've been here since since day one, and I still yeah, I mean, I still don't find any reason to wake up and not go to the stadium. No, that that was that was going to be my question, which is what keeps you coming back to the office after all of this time? Oh, man! Like I said, the energy. Um, there's literally. Kariyapa, there's not been a single day when I've woken up and said, listen, I don't feel like going today. Hmm. Or I do not want to go to the club. Not a single day in seven years. And, I mean, it's it's clearly down to the whole... It's clearly down to everyone at the club wanting to create something every single day. Yeah. Just, just, we, when our own benchmark 
we want to push the envelope every single season, every single day. Mm. We want to be responsible for the next best idea that comes out of Indian football. We want to be responsible for the best communication that is from media point of view. Uh, the boys want to do it from a football point of view. Uh, it's just, right. just, just wanting to be the best every single day drives us to come back. Me personally, uh, I, I, I've been a journalist for eight years. I've lived my dream as a journalist. It's all I ever wanted to do as a kid. Mm -hmm. And I took the sleep of faith, uh, came to a brand new city, took up a brand new job. Uh, and it's been the best decision ever. I have not awesome. given a single, a single bit of regret. And it does, mind you, it does take a lot to leave a city like Bombay. When you're born and yeah, brought yeah. up in Bombay, it does take a lot. Yeah, trust me, man. Trust me. But yeah. now Bangalore is home. Uh, I'm in Bangalore right now, season's over. But I don't want to go back home to Bombay. Uh, it's Club's family, man. It's Club's family. This whole vibe at the, the, the office, at, in that building, is unbelievable every single day. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, uh, you've just created a lot of enviable listeners to you know <laughs> you kind of you're kind of describing the perfect uh, Man, job like, right? like i say like i say i i get paid to watch football <laughs> and i don't think too many people can say that yeah. you know there's a lot, lot of lot of guys who have to make time a lot of friends who have to make who have to make time and uh, hey i can't watch the game today because i have this i, I can't say it. i just there's there's yeah there's no saying that for me I mean, I literally, I, 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 get paid, I get paid a salary and a good one at that to come and watch Neil Chetri and 35 other professionals train, like, I mean, just top-notch every single day, top-notch training every single day, awesome. and then come play a game, win a trophy. I mean, I, I get money for it, man. Come on. It's not even a job. It's wrong. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So, let's do a quick uh, rapid-fire round, okay? I mean, uh, <laughs> it's not my strongest uh, suit, but let's go for it. Go on. I promise you the questions are not scandalous. So don't worry about it. Go on. So I know your, uh, I, I know your favorite club and favorite player. Mm -hmm. uh, your favorite club is Arsenal and your favorite player is Thierry Henry. Correct? Spot on. <laughs> Spot on. So see, I know you. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to ask you, what is the most underrated club in your opinion? In world football? Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> I think, See? Yeah, Good yeah, question. Yeah. Great, great question, man. Great question. Uh, a really, really tough question. You've put me on the spot there. But uh, I probably would change my answer at some point. I'm later when I think of another club. But for now, uh, right on the top of my head, it's Ajax Amsterdam. The, the work they do is phenomenal. Uh, the kind of players that have played for the club, the list is unreal if you go to it. Unfortunately, they've made their mark elsewhere. But man, what a club! What a club! And this could have been the almost in the Champions League the year gone by. Okay, I'm gonna guess the second uh, question I'm gonna ask you. Okay, so my second question was the most underrated player. I'm gonna <laughs> stick my neck out and say it's Dennis Burkhardt. Man, absolutely, man. <laughs> absolutely, man. Come on, and guy, just just because he's. I mean, look at him, man. He could be a banker. He could be, he could be anyone doing a job with a tie. Yeah, but man, what a first touch! What a first touch! Straight from him. I used to support. I used to support Manu at that time, and I used to hate all these guys. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, phenomenal, phenomenal player. Man, whoever you support, you can't hate Bergam. Yeah, you can't. You can't. I mean, as a football fan, you you, you just can't, right? I mean, like even when you're like. Oh God! What I mean, you're still appreciating the skill it takes to do any of that. So right? yeah, that's book and book for me. Yeah, let's move to uh, Bangalore. Your favorite pub in Bangalore? I mean, I know you have to say the pub that we we both know. <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 I don't have to. <laughs> let's, let's, no, I don't have to. One is I'm a teetotaler, so oh, yeah. Okay. But but um, I, I would I would go with Arbo Brewing Company for sure, man. I would and it has a vibe. Yeah. It has the same BFC vibe. It has the BFC vibe and a very quick short story, if I may. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. We went in 2013 to God of Sikha, who owns Abo. Yeah, uh, fantastic. Yeah, great, great top guy. And we went in 2013 to Abo without having kicked a football. 
And we said, mm-hmm. listen, we are trying to do something really cool with this club. And you know, European clubs have their own home pubs and would have like to be a home pub. And he didn't even say, listen, come back to me and things like that. He said, we're all. Wow. So we entered the meeting just trying to sell the club uh, and ask for the home pub, their pub to be our home pub. And we walked mm-hmm. out in 20 minutes with our brewing company as the club's home pub. Uh, we've gone there after so many big wins, so many titles. We've gone there to celebrate, and yeah. uh, there's been there's been some great memories and great anecdotes from there. Man. So yeah, that place will always be special to me. So I'm a brewing company. Fantastic. It is, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean that's that's one of my close favorites as well. Um, okay, your best moment from the last seven years. Oh, come on. Tough question again. You're killing me, man. You're killing me, man. Let's, let's do top two, actually. Top three. Okay, cool. Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, top three, uh, not necessarily in order of priority. Uh, one would be uh, the the semi-final win in the AFC Cup or Johor. But mm. JDD and the Kandiva. 3-1, the most magical night this club's ever seen. And mm. when I say most magical night, this is in spite of us winning six trophies. And none of them... Those nights, so those evenings have been as magical as that one in in Kantiwa that night. Uh, we came we came to Bangalore, I think one one on aggregate, and uh, they scored an early goal to make it two one with an away goal, and we were just we had our backs against the wall, man. And uh, wow, what a turnaround! What so it's just special. If you ask anyone, even the players, mm-hmm. even Chetri, they all talk about that night. Uh, your whole tone changes. So yeah, that would be one. Number two is uh, Qatar 2015-16, the final of the AFC Cup. We didn't go yeah. all the way. So yeah, funnily, my favorite moments are not ones where we won a cup, but because we went, we were the only, we were the first club from the country to make it yeah. to the final, and we went and gave a really good account of ourselves. Uh, lost 1-0, but just to kind of reach there, uh, yeah. I mean, it was phenomenal, and to be part of that is phenomenal and I remember we all pulled off our medals really soon the moment they put it on us because we were so gutted at that moment but now whenever mm-hmm. I go through my draws and I find that medal I think it's, it's the most precious thing man. It's the most precious thing to me right now yeah AFC was oh, special it was special that was number yeah. two and number three is uh, just purely for emotional reasons I would say the first game our first game because mm-hmm. that's where the magic began mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, not knowing whether people would show up and then yes. realizing Sunil Chetri is uh, not on the list and uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean. We, 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 we roll our sleeves up, uh, kind of stepped into the into the muck, got our hands dirty, not knowing what the future for all of us is. Will this club yeah. shut down? Will this club ever win anything? What, yeah. what, what if it gets relegated? In the I-League, there was relegation. So yeah, so all these, yeah, yeah. All, these all these worries uh, I mean, but yeah, I mean, the first game that was when we pushed play, and man, it's it's been it's been one <laughs> crazy concert. Man. Right. Okay. One word that uh, describes Sunil Chetri. Obsessed. Really? The man's oh. obsessed. He's super disciplined. I know. Like I said, obsessed. He's obsessed. He's obsessed to want to win. He's obsessed with discipline. He's obsessed with yeah. being the best. It's an obsession that you cannot buy for any price. It's mm-hmm. an obsession that you cannot go overnight. It's right. an obsession that you cultivate from doing the same single thing every day. Man. Right. And the sweetest guy as well. I've had the pleasure of knowing him off the pitch. And he's not right. one of my closest friends. And I share a completely different rapper with him. But I still right. have the kind of... There's this respect. There's a small boundary that I draw with him. <laughs> when I when I see the when I see him operate as a professional, right, uh, you gotta look up to him, right? Yeah, yeah, and I never crossed that line because I've seen him, I've seen him day, day in day out do the same things, eat the same things, um, just not skip anything. I remember when we lost the ISL title mm. in Bangalore against Chennai. Uh, the next day, he sent me a picture in the gym. The next then next morning, the next morning. Everyone was down and grieving and crying and upset. But our man was in the gym and says, listen, oh, we're going to win the title the next year. And if we have to do that, I have to start working right. He didn't speak, wow. for, he didn't speak for the team. He spoke for himself. It's crazy. And, and we went on to win the title the next year. So, yeah. Fantastic guy. 
and a true leader as well right i mean in every but that's an in, example for everyone in every sense of the term among the things that he uh that has left an indelible mark on me and that even i use try to use rather is mm. is he says that you, you don't see him talking too much okay in addressing mm. and things like that not too much on an everyday basis and sometimes you know, you've got to say listen you know why do you say this to the boys he says listen i'm not going to say things to them i'm going to do things i want them to do so when they see me they start doing it. as a leader it's not the moments when you speak that matter it's the moments that don't that matter and you know it's it's when not to speak is what's important so it's it's just it's just phenomenal in the way so the way he leads by example he says everything is everything is brilliant everyone playing with him sharing the yeah. dressing room with him is supremely lucky right right okay one word that uh, describes uh, kunal majgonkar oh come on <laughs> i mean that's what the... <laughs> <laughs> after after you extinguished all of the words the words for, <laughs> that's for uh, you to say man <laughs> that's not for me to say that's for you to say and you even work with me so that's for you to say i i refrain from answering yeah. this question that's for you to say okay actually i wasn't prepared Good to answer morning. this but i have a word right and uh, obviously you know all of the respect everything is aside but you are the most affable guy i have ever known man in life <laughs> i'm glad you think like that i didn't I expect mean, that like so much of positive energy right it's crazy i mean i still remember um uh, you know we'd come and meet you and the rest of the day would just like i mean we'd go on that high you know we then go meet like you know three other <laughs> assholes and then they, whatever, whatever but then i mean uh, you know uh, i i every meeting that i've had with you i mean even this conversation right i mean i always go away like you know a little more higher than you know what i was so such an affable spirit i'm glad i'm glad you think like that man so let's leave it at that cuz i'm not going i'm not going to use one more to describe myself <laughs> nice okay uh so it's 6 weeks in the quarantine uh, how often do you clean do i clean ah uh, okay and here's something you should know about me i've, I've got a i have no qualms in admitting that i've got a, more than a mild ocd here. so everything's got to be everything's got to be in order for me why is that not a surprise huh? <laughs> everything's got to be in order for you man. everything's got to be in order for me i will never scratch out anything on my notebook if i made a spelling mistake with Yeah, yeah. I, wow. I will believe that you overlook it, but I don't want it to be scratched off. <laughs> so yeah, I just, I just tell myself, listen, when Karya Parithas, he's not going to spot this error, but I will not scratch it off. So yeah, I, I have these quirks, wow. but uh, no. So as far as cleaning is concerned, uh, that way the the quarantine is not making any difference to me. Uh, the one hack I've learned that you can make a really mean. or you just crumble everything uh, put it in uh, just oh. just a whole, a whole packet of chocolate yes. pure magic biscuits which i really had to nice. part with because the best way to have them is to dip them with tea but i i, I dunk it yeah. in, the, in, in the blender and saw something from an auntie online and yeah come on pure magic biscuits and baking powder and you get you get a proper brownie unbelievable <laughs> damn good what uh, books or podcasts uh, have you been like reading and listening right now i've i've really really been able to catch up on a, on a lot of books it's something i've kind of fallen back on but uh, i've i've just put down a, a book called the football man by uh, an unbelievable writer called arthur hopcraft and it talks about mm. it talks about characters in football from 60s Like from journalists to fans to mm-hmm. owners to directors to players, an unreal book. It's one of the best I've ever read. And I'm currently reading a book nice. called The Revenge of Analog, which uh, again mm-hmm. is something I kind of uh, uh, relate to a lot. And Gaurav Sikha gifted me this book. Uh, yeah, so it's all about. Uh, I have I have a habit of of writing everything on on a piece of paper, and then transferring it to Microsoft Word. So yeah. every idea wow. is is always written here crazy and uh, yeah crazy i told you i have my quotes man and a lot of the book is about how an analog is making a return how records and when i players or players and paper yeah. they all making a comeback mm. in 
I mean, they're, they're beating a lot of yeah. technology and making a comeback in some new ways. Yeah. No, I mean, I've noticed that if you write stuff down, right, there's something like, there's something very uh, tactile about it, right? I mean, I don't get that same feeling when I type stuff I, I onto the keyboard. What, and the book, book, the book says something so nice that while, while a piece of paper limits your... Uh, the number of things you could do, right? I mean... Yeah, it, it kind of limits it. It also gets the best out yeah. of you. It gets the best out of you. Yeah. Uh, I take so much time on a blank document mm. Of Microsoft because come on, it's just there in front of me and I can type and delete and type and delete. Yeah. When I'm with a piece of paper when I start, I mean that 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 paper is everything for me. Yeah. So, so everything I write down there is is critical. It kind of makes sense also, right? We've only been typing for about hundred years of our history, I think. And whereas I mean we've been writing and engraving for like God knows how long, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. And if I may there's a really cool anecdote it says an agency. When Adobe was launched, mm. this agency was so excited, this design agency, and the designers got onto it. And but they struggled with with ideas, not not with the technology. Mm. And uh, they kind of yeah, they kind of took yeah, they, they struggled despite all all the all the all the ease with the tools and things like that. Right. Uh, and then they took this big decision to to kind of bring the the software for some time on a project on a particular project and work on paper again mm. and what they did on pieces of paper was far better than what they managed in the book. yeah so, interesting yeah. very interesting how these yeah. things work yeah. so so you joined you know bfc at a time when it was still being formed and you know founded and so on right so what advice do you have for people facing the similar circumstance as you are right so no precedence as such uh, a lot of the times they have to reinvent processes, uh, they have to get people together, uh, execute on ideas and so on, right? So what advice would you have for other startup operators per se? Just just don't ever go fishing thinking you're going to catch all the fish, simple. Mm. Just don't. Because a lot of times what people people want this, this 100% returns on their investment of time. Mm. Okay. It's not going to happen all the time. So, just you will have to go test the waters. You'll have to do things that you think. Experiment. Yeah, you'll have to. You'll have to. Yeah. There is no blueprint to getting things right. Mm. So, dirty your hands, roll your sleeves up. Okay. And uh, yeah, I mean, just, just do everything with honesty. That would be my advice, man. Everything needs to be done with honesty and it always shows in your work and it eventually pulls you through. Yeah. It, I mean, uh, I even in year seven, I haven't succumbed. I mean, I, I had this conversation with the management back then saying, but listen, whatever happens, mm. we as a club will never ever pay social media to buy likes. Mm. The day you ask me to do that is the day we need to find new media management. Mm. And it's something they were really appreciative about. Mm. And if you go and see mm. now, these are stats, and we've just had a review meeting with. Our, our agency that, that pulls out all our stats uh, of how we perform in the market and things like that. And engagement wise, we're the best on social media. Yeah. We're the best. Numbers wise, we were sixth or seventh among the first mm. in terms of followers, mm. which is still okay with me. I'm, I will never lose sleep on that. Do I want to improve that? Yes. But the fact that our posts and our content is the most engaging. Is because there's a there's a massive degree of honesty in everything we put up. Yeah. It's all thought about. We spend time with our people. We spend time with our fans. We know what they want, and we're speaking their language. Very interesting. So, yeah. So we we got it wrong, like I said initially, but we've we've not taken a U-turn. Mm. There's there's been no U-turn. There's been no shortcuts. There's we just gone the whole hall. And we're still we're still learning, but we've hit the sweet spot in so many places, and we intend to keep doing so in so many other places. Fantastic, fantastic. So, what do you have uh, coming up, uh, Kunal, at the club itself? Right? I mean, uh, I know the soccer schools and academy is something that you guys have started as well. How is that going? Anything else that uh, you know we should know about what's happening? Uh no. So, yeah, I mean, the academy is phenomenal. It's in Bellary. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, at the Inspire Institute of Sport, which is uh, our mecca for, for Olympic athletes that the country represents. And it's an unreal facility. So that's that that's happening. Soccer schools is now moved on to different cities in the country. Mm -hmm. 
which is a, a big step for us. I mean, uh, and also it's revenue generation for mm. us. So, you know, from five years of being in Bangalore and now having a PhD software school in Pune, in, you know, in Gujarat, those are the next steps. So, like, it's taken us five years and now we, we have uh, the resources, the energy, the courage to, to open this as well. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's, 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 it's all part of the whole, uh, the whole desire for the club is to stay in center at some point. Right. In many ways, I feel you're just getting started. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, someone else will come and and, and basically get all the plaudits, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, we'll so, have to uh, tell the tale. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it was just so funny because just last week I was watching a movie called Togo on, on Hotstar. It's about this, it's about this uh, rescue mission that I think a set of 20 teams with dog sleds in Alaska carried out to get a uh, a vaccine through for diphtheria mm-hmm. back then, and uh, the the movie is based on on this dog called Togo who did the longest leg of I think 146 kilometers mm-hmm. with his whole team. Uh, unfortunately, he did the second last leg, the dog, and the, the dog that did the last leg of 86 kilometers was the dog that made it when the press was reading with the camera. Sucks. <laughs> and uh, and and that. And that dog's got a statue in New York, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, right now. And not to go. And not to go. Wow. Yeah, so... Wow. No, no. We're going oh, yeah, yeah. to we're gonna frame, a, uh, we're gonna frame a picture of Kunal for uh, eternity. So that yeah. uh, people who come by afterwards know that, you know, BFC was built by all of these folks, right? Like, <laughs> Chetri West. Now, uh, I, 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 would, I would at some point like, like, like to buy a ticket and walk into a game as a fan and sit in the West. Wow. Yeah. That's what I like to do, man. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah, and then just watch. That's it. Well, I hope to catch you there. <laughs> Absolutely, man. You and I will sit there, we'll go to Arbor yeah. and then head to a game, man. Old school. Old school, old school. Thanks, man. Thanks so much for doing this, Kunal. It was awesome, fun uh, talking to you again. Uh, but thanks for sharing all of those uh, experiences and insights. I mean, certainly, I mean, you know, people listening to this uh, will feel the passion with, with which, you know, you built this club and uh, take away a lot of good uh, learnings from this as well. And thank you so much for having me, Kevin. Every time I narrate all these incidents and I kind of, you know, go back, it just makes me feel so much grateful. Yeah that I have this job and that I do what I do for a living man. It's just unbelievable and just so many good memories yeah. every single time. It's just one of those things where you keep narrating them and they kind of keep getting better every time. So thank you, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, you that. deserve all of this and more, Kunal. Thank you so much, I appreciate it so much. Alright, thanks so much man, thanks so much. Cheers man. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of The Startup Operator. Every weekend, we'll interview operators at fast-growing startups and curate insights that can help you do better. This podcast is available on all popular platforms. If you like our content, don't forget to subscribe and share. Thank you. Until next time, put your head down and execute.